we have to understand that the war on drugs was never about drugs. The war on drugs functioned and it currently functions as a jobs program. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Carl Hart, who says the right to use drugs is enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. If you go to YouTube and search for Dr. Carl Hart, one of the first hits is this 2014 episode of The O'Reilly Factor. O'Reilly kicks off the show with the claim that so many people have made over the years, it almost sounds uncontroversial. Drugs are bad. If you use any intoxicating agent, your goal is to leave reality. You're not satisfied with your current state of mind. You want to get high, buzz, blasted, whatever. Some adults can handle that on occasion, others cannot. So it's literally Russian roulette. But you know who doesn't buy that line of reasoning? Dr. Carl Hart. Bill, let's, 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 let's slow down. Let's think about the last three guys who occupied the White House. They all smoked marijuana in their youth, right? (laughs) For the record, that's Barack Obama, George W. Bush, and Bill, I didn't inhale, Clinton. But as I said in the talking point, some can handle, but some cannot. That's exactly right. And the prevalence of this is overwhelming now. So you're going to have a lot of casualties on the battlefield. That's not true. Let's talk about the statistic. Let's talk about the data. In 1978, It was 37% of the 12th graders said that they smoked marijuana recently. Today, that number is down to 22%. Not the number I just gave. Well, your number is wrong. Take it up with the National Institutes of Health, all right? They're the one that that put it out. I am a council member on the National Institutes of Health. Your number is wrong. I'm telling you, it's 22% of of, of seniors who smoke marijuana in the past month. That's a fact. There are actually a lot of YouTube clips like that where Carl takes on the role of Mythbuster. The proposition that 90% 90% of people who use these drugs don't get into difficulty, that is an absolutely fanciful statistic. The 80 to 90% figure is in my book. It's in statistics that have been collected worldwide for 50, 40 years at least. Uh, Anybody who studies drugs, they know this. This This is not even controversial. You know what I find most fascinating about these clips? The comments. Sure, a few people said things like, his dreads are cool, and this makes me want to smoke the fattest blunt. But most of the comments take a totally different tone. One person wrote, thank you, Carl Hart, for being a voice of reason among these fear mongers. Another added, love you, Carl. Keep the rational, educated, researched voice alive. They sound grateful. It's like they finally found someone who's willing to stand up and call bullshit. Someone who's arguing what a lot of us already know but have been too embarrassed to admit, drugs aren't nearly as bad as everyone says they are. On occasion, they're actually pretty fun. So by now, you've got to be wondering, who is this guy? Who is Dr. Carl Hart? I grew up in the hood in Miami, in a poor neighborhood. I came from a community in which drug use was prevalent. I kept a gun in my car, I engaged in petty crime, I used and sold drugs. That's a clip from a TED Talk Carl gave. He goes on to explain how he went into the Air Force, graduated from college, earned a PhD in neuroscience, and became the first black science professor ever to receive tenure at Columbia University. Let me say that again. He's the first black science professor ever to get tenure in Columbia's history. Early on, Carl decided he was going to devote his career to solving the drug addiction problem. See, I fully believe that the crime and poverty in my community was a direct result of crack cocaine. And so I reasoned that if I could solve or cure drug addiction, I could fix crime and poverty in my community. But Carl hit a snag. Every day, he went into the lab and gave people cannabis, cocaine, heroin, and meth. He figured the results would show these drugs rot your brain and zap your willpower. But over and over again, he found something else entirely. With every drug he studied, the predominant effects were positive. Carl came to realize that he had an obligation as a scientist to dispel all the lies we've been told by the media, by politicians, and by the scientific establishment. 
he had to become an advocate for the right to get high, a practice that he came to enjoy himself. Nowhere is that advocacy more clear than in his new book, Drug Use for Grownups, Chasing Liberty in the Land of Fear. Carl connects the demonization of drugs to a long history of bigotry. He shows how drug criminalization reinforces structural racism. And he makes the compelling, and I think brave case, that drug use by responsible adults can be a good thing, a case he defends with ample scientific research and with his own experience. For the last five years, Carl has been a regular heroin user. At times, the book almost reads like a manifesto. The Declaration of Independence, he writes, asserts that each of us is endowed with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The use of drugs in the pursuit of happiness, in my view, says Carl, is arguably an act that the government is obliged to safeguard. I know that some of you out there probably think it's irresponsible to make claims like that. You probably worry that condoning drug use could have disastrous effects. I get it. But I hope you'll still listen to the conversation that follows. Because Carl isn't some reckless renegade. He recently served as the chair of the psychology department at Columbia University. He's a former member of the National Advisory Council on Drug Abuse. He's testified before Congress and written for the New York Times and Scientific American. Whether you agree with him or not, I think we can all learn something about drugs as pharmacological substances and social lightning rods by listening to Carl. And who knows, he might just change your mind. I'm Kwame Christian, and I am the CEO of the American Negotiation Institute, and I want you to check out my podcast, Negotiate Real Change. Listen to conversations with leaders in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, and learn the secrets behind what it really takes to become a successful advocate, ally, and change maker in your organization. Check out Negotiate Real Change on your favorite podcast player. Dr. Carl Hart, thank you for joining us on the Next Big Idea podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Your book, Drug Use for Grownups, is fascinating. It's courageous. And I think it's, it's probably going to be kind of controversial. You know, in the early pages of the book, you say, I'm now entering my fifth year as a regular heroin user. That, as you know, is a hell of a sentence. Uh, you know how that sounds to a lot of people out there. You're absolutely right. I know how it sounds. And um, I didn't write it to be sensationalistic or shocking. I wrote it because it's, it's true. I understand how some people may be shocked because I think the image that is conjured up in some people's minds, they think of a heroin user as someone with a needle stuck in their vein and they're nodding off and this poor soul is in need of our help. That's how we typically think of heroin users in the United States. Uh, the vast majority of heroin users say as much as 70, 80 percent are not addicted. They mm. are responsible people who take care of their family, who have an important role in their community, all of these sorts of things. But we don't know this because that's not the portrayal in the media. The portrayal is this person who is in need of our help, this person who is irresponsible. And we have this image because it's sexy. It's salacious. It ensures that you will get viewers. Imagine if the only image we had of cars would be car crashes. There are car mm, crashes, yeah. but that's not the only image that we have in our mind about cars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one, one scene I related with is you describe in the book, you're getting a colonoscopy, which, which is an experience I've had. And they ask you, you know, hey, what, what drugs do you do, if any? And, you know, you're thinking like, well, am I really going to totally share all the drugs that I do? And if I do, what are the consequences? I mean, it, do, do you feel that in publishing this book that it's a, a meaningful personal risk to you? Yeah, you're absolutely right. There is risk, but anything in life that's worth doing carries some risk. And particularly when you have oppressed groups and you have something that you can offer that will mitigate their oppression, their pain, and so forth, I, I think it's irresponsible not to speak up. And so my conscience would no longer allow me to remain in the closet while other people are suffering for doing exactly what I do. 
so yes, I'm very conscious of the risk. I'm conscious of how people will view me, what they will think. But if I didn't stand up, I would not be living like the man that I think I am. And uh, my family, my children, they would have less respect for me. Well, Carl, I, I hear your call and I'm with you. And in the course of this episode, which I did a bunch of heavy thinking about, I'm, I'm sharing all of my drug use with, with the listeners because I think you're right. There are a lot of people who suffer because of drug policy. And we all have to have the courage to, to be honest. And for me, that honesty means saying, my experience using drugs has had a net positive impact on my life. It's helped me live a happier, more satisfied, more connected life. And I think this is something people don't think about really when they think of drug use. More connected to people I love, more connected even maybe to myself. So I think, it, I think you're right. I think it's time we all told the truth about, about our relationship with drugs. I think uh, what you said was beautiful, and I wish that people have the same response that you had. If, if so, I think we're on the way to changing our society. Carl, my mother is not going to be happy about this, <laughs> let me tell you. And she is a listener. I, I hope, Mom, that you know that you raised the super guy, super kid who is responsible and doing this important work, getting these books out here and uh, encouraging more Americans to read. And if, if we are focused only on his drug use, then shame on us. Well, with that, let's, let's get to the first big idea in your book. Should we do it? Let's do it. Insight number one. Recreational drug use is, by and large, a grown-up activity. What do I mean by this? First, I have to define who is a grown-up. These are autonomous, responsible, well-functioning, healthy adults. They meet their parental, occupational, and social responsibilities. Their drug use is well-planned in order to minimize any disruptions of important life activities. These individuals get ample sleep, eat healthy diets, and exercise on a regular basis. They don't put themselves or others in dangerous situations as a result of their drug use. These are all grown-up pursuits, examples of how grown-ups take care of themselves. As you may know, growing up is difficult and it's not guaranteed. In other words, neither this book nor drug use is for everyone. They are for those who have managed to grow up. I love that line. Growing up is difficult and it's not guaranteed. Ain't that the truth? I have three boys. The oldest is a teenager. And I don't take the growing up part for granted. I think it's <laughs> happening. I think it's happening. But sometimes I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I have to tell you, man, as, as I listen to that insight, number one, I'm like, damn, who recorded this, Mr. Rogers? Uh, <laughs> so um, I really miss the social interaction when we do these kinds of things, because I did that recording alone um, in my soundproof booth. Um, I would do that over. Well, I'll tell you, it had a real impact on me listening to those insights. But, you know, I know you have kids as well, right? What, what have you said to your own kids about drug use? Yeah. So you have to understand, I've been studying drugs like most of my life. And my kids grew up with their father going into the lab, getting ready to administer some drug, whether it's crack cocaine or methamphetamine or marijuana. So uh, drugs have just been a part of my kids' life. We didn't have like the drug conversation. We don't do that. The thing that we do is we reinforce the values that we care about, my wife and I, and that's we wanted our kids to do well in school and we wanted our kids to contribute to their community. And other activities like video games or potentially drug use or significant others, girlfriends or what have you, they were all kind of peripheral. As long as they were handling those number one goals, they had no problem. The only drugs we really talked about were alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana, because those are the drugs that uh, children or young people are most likely to use. Um, and so the, the concern with what alcohol was that uh, they would take too much and pass out. And so we helped them to identify those symptoms when that happened or if it happened to a friend. 
The concern with tobacco was that both of my kids have asthma, and so we made sure they had their pump. Uh, mm-hmm, and the concern mm-hmm. with cannabis is uh, primary. They were black boys that they would uh, have the police, some police interaction. So we talked about how mm-hmm. to make sure you minimize police interactions. That's the, about the extent of our drug education. Drugs were mm-hmm. not special. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I've in the course of reading your book, I've been thinking about as as I mentioned, I've got three boys. The oldest is is fifteen, and um, what I worry about the most is them buying contaminated stuff or using drugs in an environment that's not safe. Yeah, the contaminants are the major concern with drugs. Uh, they are oftentimes more dangerous than the drugs themselves. And in the United States, we're not doing anything. We can simply make this activity more safe by making sure that we have uh, anonymous uh, testing facilities. That is, people can submit small samples of their drug to find out the complete chemical composition that's contained in that substance and dose and so forth. Um, they do this sort of thing in Spain, in the Netherlands, in um Austria and Colombia and a number of countries. We don't do it in the United States. And and this would go a long way in keeping uh, our citizens safe. We don't do it here uh, in large part because of moralism. Um, we say things like, well, that would send the message that we're encouraging drugs. You know, it's it's like the condom thing. If we hand out condoms, then that sends the message that we condone premarital sex. Um, it's the most ridiculous sort of rationale or reasoning But in the process, you put my children at at risk and we're putting other people's children at risk. Absolutely. When I think of how the role that drugs have played in my own life, I think of three categories. I think of dealing, you know, just surviving, like getting through the day, getting a good night's sleep. Then there's feeling good. And then there's sort of like the transcendent experiences, the growth experiences that really kind of open your mind. Historically, the dealing category is where I'm least convinced that I'm doing the right thing. Like in my own case, I end up drinking a glass of wine or two just to downshift my brain, you know? But reading your book, you make a compelling case that there's nothing wrong with using drugs, and I'm including alcohol here, obviously, to help us deal. And you say, I'm quoting from your book here, my position as department chairman, I think this was at Columbia, right? was far more detrimental to my health than my drug use ever was. And you go on to say that your drug use has been largely protective against the negative health consequences of negotiating pathology-producing environments. Yes. So it's, it sounds like you recommend drugs as, as a de-stressing solution. I can't recommend to, for other people. I'm saying how helpful it was to me. Now, you understand, I know a lot about drugs, pharmacology, and I know where to get uh, substances that are not tainted and that sort of thing. The major thing that I am uh, trying to get the reader to understand, I'm trying to get the reader to understand what it means to be an American. And it's laid out in the Declaration of Independence, where each citizen is guaranteed at least three birthrights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When you get away from the jingoistic sort of thinking about this statement and really unpack it, what it means is that you as an adult, you have the right to live your life as you see fit, as long as you don't disrupt other people from doing the same. And if you choose to use drugs in your pursuit of happiness or as an expression of your liberty, Mm. So be it. That's your right as an American adult. But Americans don't, they've sacrificed this right. And in the process, they've sacrificed my right. And I don't like it. And so that's the larger sort of thing I'm trying to get people to understand. What does it mean to be American? I certainly get the sense reading your book that you're trying every day to be a kinder, more generous, more thoughtful, more understanding human being, while at the same time being competent and strong and navigating the world, which is not an easy balance. It's something we all try to do. And that drugs are tools in your toolbox that help you do that. For many of us, for the 30 million some Americans who do choose to use drugs, probably most of us believe that they help us be a better person. 
Absolutely. There are a number of people who use drugs in that way. Uh, I like how you put it in terms of it's just an, it's just another tool in the toolbox. I think about going to see live comedy. I love live comedy. That's how I think about drug use. It helps me to recharge, to uh, reevaluate and think about the world differently, think about the world in a, and people in more generous terms. That's what comedians do for me. That's what drugs do for me. And I have to tell you, reading your book, it reminds me that if alcohol is the only tool in your toolbox, you're walking around with nothing but a hammer. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right? I mean, that, that, that all these different drugs are engaged psychoactively in different subtle ways and, and that they are tools to some degree, right, that help us accomplish different things as human beings. Do you, do you feel that way? Absolutely. Uh, They're pharmacological tools. And some people choose alcohol as their tool of choice. And that's okay. Um, I don't want to be judgmental about what people select as their tool. If it works, cool. But just uh, understand that other people have other tools that, that work for them. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. We use these tools. We use caffeine. Uh, in the morning to be more alert. Uh, Alcohol, of course, is that social sort of lubricant and anxiety-relieving tool. And we could think of heroin as an anxiety-relieving tool, as a tool that produces more empathy in the same way. And that's that's an idea that's going to be foreign to a lot of listeners. I've certainly had the experience in my own life of feeling that, that I got to know myself better in the process of, of experimenting with drugs, I, I kind of stopped using most of these drugs other than occasional marijuana for the, most of the last 15 years. Last year, for the first time, Carl, in, in, I don't know, 20 years, I did some magic mushrooms with some friends. And, you know, we had long conversations. We were dancing in the snow at one point outside. And at one point, I was lying on my back with a good friend on a shag carpet, and we laughed for two or three minutes nonstop. I mean, it was beautiful. And why do we stop laughing like that as adults, right? And in that sense, it's like grownups also need time to not be grownups. I would modify and say that uh, being playful and joyful is part of being a grownup. Uh, yes, that's part of yes. the experience. You don't stop being a grownup. For example, while you are being playful and having a good time, if there is an emergency, you can still respond in a grown-up way, and you're still the same person. Yes. Um, and that's one of the sort of myths that we have surrounding drugs is that we're worried that you will be irresponsible. That's just silly. Um, I certainly have been in situations where you might have been intoxicated, but then the situation calls for you to shift gears and handle the, resp- the situation in an adult sort of way. No problem. You shift gears. Yep, that's right. But you do point out that not everyone successfully makes the transition to adulthood, right? That's exactly right. And, you know, I think that probably where a lot of listeners are probably given pause when when we get to some of the arguments, as we will, about legalizing all drugs, legalizing some drugs, you know, what the right path forward is, is how do we deal with all the folks in our society who have not successfully become grownups, you know, and and there there are plenty of overgrown children walking around. One of them was just in the White House. You say in the book that you don't recommend recreational drug use for people with mental illness or in acute emotional distress, but that's not always so easy to identify, right? Not even in ourselves sometimes, much less other people. How do we make sure the non-grownups don't kill themselves or, or other people? Well, I think that's a trap. Every year in the United States, 40,000 Americans lose their lives in car accidents and car crashes. But we're not talking about banning cars. Life is not without risk. If we want to think about how do we minimize the harms associated with drugs or anything in a society in general, uh, we should start with thinking about uh, making sure that Americans have health care, making sure that we take care of Americans, making sure that people have gainful employment. That will go a lot longer way 
to dealing with these issues than our sort of thinking about drugs or talking about drugs even. It's not complicated why people get addicted. People get addicted because of co-occurring psychiatric illnesses, uh, because they have lost, uh, for example, their role in society that was brought to them by having a middle-class paying job. Yeah, All yeah. of these are reasons why people get in trouble with drugs, not the drugs themselves, yeah. But the conversation as it, it relates to d- drugs or liberalizing our drug policy focuses on the drug as if the drug caused these problems. The drug didn't cause these problems. GM moving to foreign countries caused this problem. People closing down the factories looking for cheaper labor caused these problems. Yeah. Um, and we never focus the attention where it needs to go. Yeah, that is. I, I think that's such an important point. But when you talk about how often it's that people have psychiatric illnesses that are exacerbated by the drugs or you have some things are are dangerous combinations, when you think about the policy of changes to drug laws, do you think that that some drugs should be only offered by prescription or that there should be some process through which we screen to prevent those risks from, from occurring? Uh, first of all, I think that we should have a requirement before people can uh, obtain drugs, just like we think about alcohol. The person has to be 21 years of age, just like we think about driving an automobile. The person has to pass a competency exam. Mm-hmm. We can do this with drugs. We can make sure that these folks meet certain requirements before mm-hmm. they can obtain these drugs. Um, that's no problem. But when we start talking about making these things available by prescription, and that means that the medical community can get in their role as cops, as gatekeepers, no, not no, but hell no. I don't want any more gatekeepers like that because what happens is that uh, the medical community just behaves just like cops. It gives them an opportunity to participate in discrimination as they see fit. Mm, Uh, That that happens today with something like opioid prescriptions. Uh, Black people are far less likely to get an opioid prescription than their white counterparts, in part because of American racism. I don't want to have the medical community involved in uh, whether or not I should uh, be able to go and get some alcohol. Imagine Mm -hmm. having Mm -hmm. someone write you a prescription for alcohol. That's ridiculous. And I think the same is true in this case. And, and and I guess part of part of the logic there is that most of these drugs, in your judgment, are not more dangerous than alcohol. Would you say that? I mean, an alcohol is a pretty dangerous drug when you think about it. I mean, you know, you, you can do a lot of harm on alcohol. But do you think Absolutely. that's true? I, I think that uh, drugs, the danger of drugs uh, depends upon a variety of factors. Um, alcohol certainly can be more dangerous than heroin. When you think about alcohol withdrawal, People can die from alcohol withdrawal. Uh, it's really difficult to die from heroin withdrawal. That's like um, that's virtually um, not heard of. So it all depends on what measure we're looking for the, to determine uh, the, whether or not a drug is toxic. You know, the changes that have occurred in the last 30 years, I mean, I don't know about you, Carl, but when I was in high school, I could not have imagined that in 30 years you'd be able to walk into a store and purchase some marijuana. What do you think we're going to see in the next few decades? Do you think that we're on a path towards broader legalization? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, In 1992, remember when Bill Clinton was running for president um, and he couldn't even admit to uh, inhaling marijuana. He said some silly shit like he, he smoked, but he didn't inhale. We know that's ridiculous now, but he couldn't acknowledge smoking marijuana in 1992. Then you fast forward 29 years later, we have 15 states that have legalized marijuana for uh, recreational use for adults. And we can expect that number to grow primarily because of the revenue generating potential of legal marijuana. Not because it's the morally right thing to do. Not because we found out new pharmacological information. Nope. Because it it will help with the economy. And we are coming Mm -hmm. out of a global pandemic. uh, And states will be looking for ways to um, stimulate their local economies. And marijuana, they know, 
uh, can do that. And so we can expect to see even more states legalizing marijuana for adult use. That's with a caveat. The caveat being that states in the South, states with a large black population, they yeah. will uh, be slow to legalize marijuana for recreational use because marijuana still functions as uh, an important probable cause mechanism for their mm. law enforcement officials. And law enforcement and their lobby will fight uh, marijuana legalization because it's an important tool used to subjugate Black populations in the South. Hey, I'm Michael Kavnat, host of the Next Big Idea Daily. The show is a masterclass in better living from some of the smartest writers around. Every morning, Monday through Friday, we'll serve up a quick 10-minute lesson on how to strengthen your relationships, supercharge your creativity, boost your productivity, and more. Follow the Next Big Idea Daily wherever you get your podcasts. Dosing on drugs? If your mom shoots dope every day like mine, you can only help her if you know the signs of an overdose. An overdose? Yes, an overdose. Don't call the ambulance if you're in doubt, unless she shakes uncontrollably or foams at the mouth. That's an overdose. Okay, that's an overdose. Mm hmm. That's an overdose. Yes, that's a Muppets knockoff band singing about overdoses. It's one colorful example of the hundreds upon hundreds of anti-drug advertisements that have aired since the dawn of the drug war. Watch enough of them, and you could easily start believing that anyone who does drugs is certain to become an addict on the path to overdosing. But in his second big idea, Carl says, that's just not true. Insight number two, the majority of drug users do not become addicted. Yep, you heard me right. 70 to 90% of people who use even the most vilified drugs, such as heroin or crack cocaine, are not addicts. These individuals pay their bills, look after their health, take care of their families, as well as other responsibilities. They are scientists, politicians, educators, Activists, entrepreneurs, artists, media personalities, and more. They are your children, your siblings, your parents, your grandparents. They are you, me. So why does it surprise you then to learn that most drug users do not become addicted? It's simple. Addiction receives almost all the attention certainly media attention. It's far more sexy to read about a guy who used heroin, became addicted, ruined his life, and resurrected it, than it is to read about a woman who uses heroin to enhance social interactions, but meets all her responsibilities. Think about it. Have you ever read a newspaper article or seen a film about heroin that didn't focus on addiction? This disproportionate focus on addiction when discussing drugs has not only made us less safe, but also less free. In Drug Use for Grownups, I discuss how this approach has put us at greater risk and has led to us losing fundamental and sacred liberties. Carl, I think there's nothing wrong with being the Mr. Rogers for drug use. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that because you have a great voice <laughs> <laughs> no 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 listen whenever i hear myself i think oh gosh uh, that can't be me now uh if you ask people to fill in the blank what comes after drug it's addict right it's it, it, yes. you know the baggage that the word carries with it is extraordinary and so you think that our public perception of the addictiveness of drugs is, is, is really substantially overstated. 
Yeah. When we think about drugs like heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, we go to the frame of addiction. We think that we have to save these people who use these drugs as if these people have somehow lost their autonomy and they didn't make a choice. The casual observer thinks that most people who use heroin, uh, they are addicted. And it's just not true. Just like with alcohol, there are people who have problems, but the vast majority of the alcohol drinkers are not alcoholics, just like the vast majority of heroin users are not heroin addicts. And so once people understand that, they can reasonably follow the arguments, but you have to first bring them along because they have been inundated all of their lives thinking of heroin as only an addiction-producing substance. Yeah, it's amazing how powerful our associations are with different drugs. You know, when you think of cocaine, and actually of all the, I'll, I'll tell you, in my thinking through, Carl, you know, sharing what we're sharing in the show today, uh, what made, gave me the greatest trepidation was sharing with people that I have used and, in, and enjoyed cocaine. The, the associations with it are so insidious, right? It's some wide-eyed maniac, Wall Street asshole who's like doing lines off a hooker or whatever. I mean, it's just and, and, crazy. And that person exists, but that person is not representative of cocaine users. Right, right. It's some extreme. You don't think of Sigmund Freud, you know, uh, <laughs> reinventing how we think about the human mind, writing countless books with extreme lucidity, right? Which, which was true, right? I believe Freud exactly. was, a, was a hardcore cocaine user, wasn't he? I mean, every yeah. day. He was I don't know cocaine. if he would have called himself a hardcore, because, <laughs> but he was certainly <laughs> an avid cocaine user. <laughs> yes, yes. Enthusiastic, you might say. Yeah. And part of what's astonishing to me about it, and what I think really kind of is eye-opening for any listeners who are kind of unconvinced, right, is that we ha often have cases of effectively the same drug called different names with which we have radically different associations, right? So example, Adderall. If little Johnny in a nice middle-class family is not getting the grades that his parents expect, well, we trot him off to a $500 an hour psychiatrist and he comes out with an Adderall prescription. But it, it, as I understand it, it, it it's, it's chemically not that different from meth, right? And the associations we have with meth are just night and day radically different. Yes. So the active ingredient in something like Adderall is amphetamine. And methamphetamine is made from the amphetamine structure. You just add another methyl group. And then when you, for example, we and other people, we tested methamphetamine versus amphetamine in the lab under double-blind conditions. And what we find is that they produce nearly identical effects. In effect, the drugs are the same. But our narratives and the stories that we tell about these drugs uh, are wildly different. But that's that's anecdote. That's not the real evidence. The evidence is that they're the same drug, essentially. You know, how much do you think that the drug war changed our perceptions or was successful in doing what it set out to do? I mean, I think of growing up, you know, this is your brain on drugs. You know, yes. the, the, the egg in the, in the sizzling yes. frying pan. It's like, oh, my God. This is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Do you think those campaigns were successful? Do you, you want to share a little bit of the history of the anti-drug propaganda? Yeah, when we think about the modern-day drug war, people like to start with Nixon in 1971, announcing that, you know, there's going to be a war on drugs. But the modern-day drug war didn't really start until the end of Reagan's sort of second term and the beginning of Bush one. And we have to understand that the war on drugs was never about drugs. The war on drugs functioned and it currently functions as a jobs program. It's important for people to understand that when we intensified the modern war on drugs, factories were closing in the Rust Belt, people were losing their jobs. And one way you could help replace some jobs, uh, although the pay wasn't as good, 
was that you hire more police officers. And that's what we did. We hired more police officers and people got jobs in law enforcement. They didn't pay as well, as I, I said. And another problem was with that was that they were primarily jobs for white people. And these jobs were predicated on the imprisonment of black and brown bodies. That's why we now have more than 2 million Americans behind bars. And we know that black men, for example, make up 6% of the general population, but damn near 40% of the incarcerated population. That's the result of the war on drugs. And this notion that it w- we were going to rid our communities of drugs, that never was really the goal. The goal was to increase these sort of industries' employment, uh, employment in law enforcement, uh, treatment providers, uh, prisons. We built more prisons, and the industries that pop up around prisons, like hotels, restaurants, the phone companies made a lot of money. That's what the war on drugs is. The war on drugs is a jobs program. That's a, that's an extraordinary statement. Yeah, the um, well, the history that you share in the book is fascinating and shocking. And you say that until the early 20th century, Americans were pretty much free to use drugs as they saw fit. You point out Thomas Jefferson was an avid opioid user, I think. Yes. And, you know, opium and cocaine were available as over-the-counter products. And what's extraordinary that you describe is that The fear that people had, you started having these Chinese workers come to the United States and opening opium dens, which was kind of, I guess, a cultural part of their experience that they brought with them. And there was this fear of white Americans going into these dens. And meanwhile, cocaine was associated with a fear that African Americans who used cocaine became these kind of invincible violent people who were impervious to bullets, right? Yes. <laughs> it's just dumb. Yes. So there was all this kind of fear of the other and effectively these like racist responses bundled up in our relationship with these drugs. Yeah, maybe I should tell the story of cocaine and how cocaine became illegal in the United States. Uh, the thing that uh, it's important for people to know is that uh, about eight, 1994 or so, um, this guy, John Pendleton, uh, had this formulation of, of cocaine and alcohol. It was called the coca wine. And he was out of Atlanta. And Atlanta, uh, maybe 1898, 1899, decided to ban alcohol for the city of Atlanta. So they had alcohol prohibition long before the country had alcohol prohibition. So Pendleton had to come up with a formulation that didn't include alcohol. So what he did was he added carbonated water and sugar. And voila, you have Coca-Cola. That's what his drink was. And he put his drink in these fountains that were in the sort of pharmacies. And these fountains were only open to white people. And so white folks could go and enjoy their Coca-Cola with cocaine. Later, uh, he decided to put the the, the Coca Cola in bottles. Now, black people have access to Coca Cola in bottles because the bottles anyone could purchase. It wasn't like this sort of uh, the fountains where black people weren't uh, allowed. When black people got access to cocaine, certain white folks didn't like that. And then, then we started to see these stories in the scientific literature, in the popular literature, associating heinous crimes with black people who used cocaine. Of course, these were all exaggerations, but that led to the ultimate banning of cocaine, at least for black people. And with opioids, a similar sort of story happened with the Chinese, uh, with Mary marijuana, a similar sort of thing happened with Mexican-Americans. And so this history tells us that our drug laws are not based on pharmacology or science. It's based on American racism. And that infiltrates our drug policy even to this day. It's extraordinary because we've all grown up with drugs being illegal. But the notion that this is really a very recent thing this business of making drugs illegal that, as you say, is bound up in fear and hatred 
of different minorities. As I understand it, um, a lot of people believe that you go back millions of years that human brains and plant neurotoxins co-evolved. As you point out in the book, drugs only have an effect because we have receptors for that drug. Right, right. I mean, there, there's something like, I believe there's something like 60 million different possible chemical compounds, and there are only a handful that actually connect to receptors. Yeah, let's think about opioids from that perspective. So opioids are important for pain relief, pleasure, all of these sorts of things. Opioids, by the way, are drugs like heroin, morphine, oxycodone. Uh, our bodies had an internal or endogenous uh, opioid system. That is, we mm. have our own morphine in the brain. That's the reason why morphine or heroin, which is essentially morphine, that's why heroin can have an effect because our bodies already has a, a, a type of heroin in, it, in itself, in, endogenously. The same is true with cannabis. Our body has an endogenous cannabinoid system. And for cocaine to be able to act, it has to ha interact with receptors that are already in the body. Yeah, it makes sense. But I think somebody who's skeptical might say, okay, we have a human natural attraction to sugar and salt, but in our ancestral environment, we did not have unlimited access to sugar and salt. We have a brain that responds favorably to opioids, there's pain relief, there's pleasure, there's euphoria. But in our ancestral environment, we did not have the possibility of having, of triggering that regularly. What would you say to that concern? You know, th that we have pleasure centers that evolved only to be triggered occasionally, not over and over and over again. We have feet so we can travel and move, but we have airplanes to help us get to places more quickly now. I would say it's more convenient to tr take an airplane from New York to L.A. than it is to use my feet, and I'm going to use that convenience. So if we have a drug like heroin that does it more effectively or more efficiently, we just have to learn how to live with it, just like we've learned how to live with airplanes. That's why we have this big brain. It's evolved to be cognitively flexible. Right, exactly. It's getting, it's getting back to the tool notion, that we've, that we've developed more sophisticated tools to trigger you know, these responses when we maybe need them in our lives. Like we need some, some peace, some pain relief, some what have you. Coming up after the break, Carl tells policymakers what they can do to help people avoid dependency. Hint, it has nothing to do with drugs. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. Well, getting back to addiction, even if it's been overblown in the media, certainly addiction's a real problem. What responsibility do you think policymakers have to help people avoid dependency? They have a responsibility to ensure that citizens have gainful employment. That would go a long way in dealing with addiction. Uh, mm. They have a responsibility to ensuring that, that uh, their citizens have health care. That will go a long way in dealing with addiction. Uh, make sure that people have a sense of worth in your society will go a long way in dealing with addiction. Making sure that people have access to education, that goes a long way in dealing with addiction. That would be really helpful if politicians uh, would attend to these uh, concerns. Yeah, interesting. 
Well, I think it may be time for big idea number three. Insight number three. People are dying because of ignorance, not because of opioids. For those who may not know, opioids are pain medications like oxycodone and heroin. Some people also use these drugs to get high. Perhaps that's one reason opioids have been blamed for the recent overdose crises. Consider the year 2018, for example. More than 45,000 Americans died with at least one opioid drug in their bodies. Now, does this mean an opioid drug caused all these deaths? I think not. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that opioid overdose isn't a real risk. It is. But the odds of this occurring have been overstated, greatly so. For example, it's certainly possible to die after taking too much of a single opioid drug, but such deaths account for only about a quarter of the thousands of opioid-related deaths. Tainted opioid drugs and opioids taken in combination with other sedatives, including alcohol or benzodiazepine, cause the vast majority of these deaths. In other words, many deceased drug users likely didn't know that the drug that they took contained contaminants. Others didn't know that combining an opioid with another sedative increases risk of overdose. The bottom line is this. People are not dying because of opioids. They are dying because of ignorance. So this may be the most controversial section of the book. Do you think that there's a an opioid crisis happening? I think that there is a crisis in opioid reporting information that's happening. For example, when we think about how we record opioid deaths, that system is flawed, deeply flawed, such that we're not getting an accurate account of what's actually going on. And I'll tell you why the system is flawed. The system is flawed in large part because of the widely varying education among the people who do death investigations. Two classes of people do death investigations. Medical examiners, these are medical physicians who have specialized training in forensic pathology. And the other class are coroners. These individuals, the only requirement they typically have is a high school diploma and they be a registered voter. Uh, and they do some sort of course that varies in number of hours, uh, as little as eight hours to like 32 hours of training. I'm concerned that these folks are uh, calling things an opioid death when in fact they don't know if the opioid caused the death. They're only responding to the fact that an opioid was found in a person's system. And what happens with most of these deaths is that in the deceased body, there is contained multiple drugs, uh, maybe an opioid, alcohol, benzodiazepine, and antihistamine, a wide range of drugs. And so without emphasizing this fact, we mislead the public into believing that opioids are so dangerous when in fact we can help people by telling them to avoid specific drug combinations. So that's my real concern there on the one hand. Another concern that I have is that many of these deaths are caused by tainted drugs, and we can deal with the tainted drug issue by simply starting up these uh, facilities that test people's drugs anonymously so they can uh, see the complete chemical composition in their substance, as opposed to placing all of this emphasis on Opioids are bad. Opioids are bad. Mm. We're not doing our citizens uh, a service by doing that. Uh, instead, we're just frightening people without giving them a means to deal with the problem. You know, those testing centers just seem like such a clear thing that should be done. And I hope that people who read your book change the policies and support that. But on a personal level, there are two people I know, I've known in my own life who've died of drug-related deaths, and they, they both were heroin-related. 
So I do come at this with this gut sense that like, gosh, just looking at my own life of people I know, like that opioids overdoses seem to be where the worst outcomes happen. I'm sure it's true that, as you say, there are lots of different things in the bloodstreams of these people, but the commonality is the opioid. Would you not say that you think that there's greater risk of overdose lethality when opioids are involved than when they're not? Uh, no, I would not say that. Um, let's just think about the commonality, like you said. My aunt died in a car accident. Nobody's talking about banning cars. We just figure out how to make this thing more safe. And, and, and so when we talk about opioids, we talk about it in this sort of unique way. It's really difficult to die from a heroin overdose when that's the only drug involved. Experienced heroin users don't usually die from overdose because they are tolerant to heroin-related effects, and that decreases mm. the likelihood of them dying from an overdose. People are dying primarily because of these contaminants, and they're dying primarily because of ignorance. They don't know that they shouldn't mix an opioid with another sedative, and they don't think of alcohol as being another sedative. People die in part because they may take too much of this particular opioid formulation, Percocets. Percocets contain oxycodone, a small dose, and a large dose of acetaminophen or Tylenol. If you take, I don't know, 10 of those pills or 20 of those pills for consecutive days, you run the risk of having liver failure and dying, not because of the opioid, but because of the Tylenol. Tylenol is the number one reason for liver toxicity in the world. This kind of information, people just simply don't know. So therefore, they're dying of ignorance. Wow. I did not know that. That's extraordinary. You know, something that's, that, that to me is, is fascinating about what we've seen with the opioid epidemic is that because it's poor white people, right, who, who have, at least in the public conception, have, have been the people most often overdosing. We've embraced more of this view of it's not a drug problem, it's a jobs problem, or it's a despair problem, or it's a lack of hope problem, right? And, and do you think that because the opioid epidemic has hit poor white people more so than other races, that there's been more sympathy and, and more attention to this? Uh this is how we handle every drug issue in the United States. Uh, people just don't uh, have a long memory. We did the same thing with crack. Um, there were always more white crack users. They went to treatment. The black users went to jail. We did the same thing with heroin in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, the soldiers coming back from Vietnam, the white users, they got methadone or they got treatment. Uh, black folks, a lot of them went to jail. This, this is how we handle these things in America. So what I'm trying to do is just encourage the society to look beyond the drug. And if we do that, then we can help a greater number of people. And I'm trying to ask folks to stop arresting people for simply using drugs. Just have that yeah, as yeah. a policy, just like they've recently done in a place like Oregon. Oregon now has decriminalized all drugs in effect what they have said. We will no longer arrest people for simply using a drug. Yep, yep, it makes a lot of sense. One thing that surprised me was that you didn't see the big pharma companies as more complicit in the opioid crisis. I mean, we know, like in the year 2015, physicians wrote more than 226 million opioid prescriptions and this was a result of a massive lobbying effort. I think there was like a 10x increase in opioid prescriptions. There was $880 million of lobbying money spent to convince lawmakers to make op opioids more readily available. Massive marketing to doctors. That same year, those legal painkillers were linked to most of the opioid overdose deaths. 33,000 people died. Don't you think that there was a profiteering kind of lack of sensitivity to human life there? Yeah. Yep. I absolutely agree with you. Um, 
But this is what American capitalism looked like. Um, I am concerned that the focus on the pharmaceutical industry here, uh, it infantilizes us as a society. We have choices to make as adults. You can choose to engage in a certain behavior and you can choose not to. You still have the responsibility. It, it, it's remarkable to me. We're looking for a Hitler. Um, and then so that way we don't have to deal with any of the underlying causes or these other issues. We blame the pharmaceutical companies. Now we move on. The pharmaceutical companies, they do deserve a fair amount of blame. But that's what they do. Uh, th- this is not unique. And, and, and I think that we have given them uh, more blame than they deserve here. Uh, the blame uh, should also uh, be centered on our politicians. Um, mm. uh, if people are seeking opioids to alter their consciousness, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, particularly if they're doing so at the exclusion of other important life functions. Something else is going on. It's not just the pharmaceutical companies. It's not like pharmaceutical companies got this poor helpless person and they're forcing them to take opioids. That's ridiculous. Yep. No, I think I, I think that logic makes a lot of sense that when people don't have jobs, when people don't have hope, when people are bankrupted because they don't have health insurance and so on and so on, they're going to self-medicate in ways that may be self-destructive. And if it's not opioids, it's going to be something else. Right? Is that what you'd say? I mean, Especially if they, they don't it, have any it's opportunities it's like, and life is grim. I mean, what do you expect? What, exactly. If it's not opioid, it's alcohol. In fact, alcohol is com- combined with this opioid sort of crisis that people are talking about. This is really also an alcohol crisis. It's also uh, other types of, of crises. People have domestic violence issues. All kinds of issues are going on. But if we focus on the opioids, we don't have to talk about those other issues. Can you share your own experience with opioids? I know you're so forthcoming in, in the book. You intentionally went through withdrawal as a kind of test. I think that was, that was almost maybe part of your exploration of trying to understand the drug and address questions of addiction. You were almost flirting with addiction. Do you feel ever uh, afraid or concerned that you're playing with fire? Uh, no, I wasn't flirting with addiction. I know the myth and the bullshit that we've told a society, so I, I, I know that I won't become addicted because I have too much to do. I have too many people depending on me, and I know how to set aside time for an activity that I enjoy. I know how to do that. But you're right. I did um, uh, put myself through opioid withdrawal. I did so because um, I have been saying for years that opioid withdrawal is like the flu, uh, and some people were uh, upset. When I said that, uh, well, it's unpleasant, but not life-threatening. And so I decided uh, for the book that I would put myself through opioid withdrawal. And then I would go to work the next day like I normally do. And I would show people that withdrawal uh, is not addiction. Withdrawal is just those unpleasant effects that you, you deal with upon abrupt discontinuation of chronic use of something. You can get withdrawal from stopping your antidepressant medication. And so in the book, I describe my experience with heroin or opioid withdrawal, and um, I, it, it was just like I expected. It was like the flu. It was unpleasant, and I had some abdominal pain that was more severe than I thought it would be, but I was, it was never life-threatening. And um, so I did it. I don't have any plans to ever do that again. I certainly will never put myself through alcohol withdrawal because that is life-threatening. Um, And so I wanted to make a point, and the point was made, and we move on. That is a walk in the walk, uh, which is impressive. Well, I think we're ready for big idea number four. Insight number four. The negative impact of recreational drug use on the brain has been terribly overstated. Simply put, there is virtually no evidence indicating that drug use causes brain abnormalities in otherwise healthy individuals. Well, answer me this, you may ask. Why do so many people believe differently? The short answer is that they have been skillfully misled. The long answer is contained within the pages of my book. 
Suffice to say, not only has the media misrepresented so-called brain findings, researchers have routinely overinterpreted and distorted many of these effects by looking critically beyond the pretty pictures produced by brain imaging and drug use for grown-ups, I challenged the notion that drug use causes brain dysfunction. The sexy images so often touted by some neuroscientists rarely show any actual data, but this doesn't temper the unsubstantiated claims made about the brain-damaging effects produced by drugs. This irresponsible behavior, I argue, has contributed to inappropriate drug policies. Policies that have led to racial discrimination, group marginalization, and preventable deaths. I urge you to read my book so you will have the information needed to advocate for more humane and appropriate drug policy. Well, Carl, you don't pull any punches in this book. You don't just criticize the media and the government, and I would say for good reason. But you also argue that scientists, even some of our most prominent scientists, have shown bias in interpreting their results when studying drugs. Is that right? Yeah. uh, It's painful to uh, see what we're doing uh, in science when it comes to drugs. Um, The major reason why scientists have remained silent and they haven't come out as public as I am is because it's lucrative to um, toe the party line. Um, uh, You get your grants funded, uh, you ensure that there is enough money set aside for your uh, area of research by exaggerating or not correcting the exaggerations associated with um, the harmful effects of drugs. Um, And so uh, I'm arguing and I'm presenting evidence that scientists are complicit and they are complicit because there are incentives for them to be complicit. Do you feel like there's risk of your not getting grants in the future because of taking this position? Uh, no, I don't feel like it. Uh, it's a it's a fact. <laughs> what you just said was a fact. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. I'm unpopular with our uh, main funding agency, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Uh, I used to be uh, on their advisory council, which is the highest sort of advisory mm-hmm. board in our field. Um, I did my term and I'm no longer on the advisory council. Uh, The thing is, is that I am far more concerned about what happens to the broader American society than I am uh, about my sort of standing in uh, this small scientific community, especially when the community, I don't think, in large part, are are living up to the promise uh, or the ideals of the country. It's like you, um, Mm. you call it as you see it and you follow the data and the chips fall where they may. And in your early years as a scientist, you described that you yourself were expecting to find evidence that drug use had much more severe negative impacts than you found that it did. Uh, Did did you feel like you were uh, had some bias at that time? I absolutely had bias at that time. Um, Yeah, sure. I bought the party line and um, I was looking for negative effects and I couldn't see the positive effects because I was so blinded by my search to find negative effects. So, yes, I was a problem. I played a role. I benefited from um, the exaggeration of harmful effects associated with drugs. And so this is kind of like my mea culpa as well. Well, you say there are virtually no data on humans indicating that responsible recreational drug use causes brain abnormalities in otherwise healthy individuals. So you're saying no memory loss, no breakdown of the dopamine reward system. There's not really evidence of that. Yeah, it's kind of it's funny when we start talking about reward systems. I don't know if there is a such thing as called the reward system. We have distilled it down in that way when we talk to the public, but I, I don't think the I don't know if the brain has a reward system. There are certain structures that play a role in reward, but these same structures 
play a role in <clears throat> stress response and a wide range of things. And so it's inaccurate probably to call these things reward system, but we certainly don't see or we haven't observed alterations such that uh, these alterations are long-term negative alterations as a result of uh, recreational drug use in otherwise healthy people. Um, we look at brain imaging studies and a number of other studies, and you, you, you just don't see it. Although the language that people uh, use to describe their data will have you believe that there are these wow, the uh, different effects observed in these different groups. and But the data just did not support that narrative. So how do you think we eliminate or at least reduce this anti-drug bias in science? Um, uh, we call it out uh, in the science and we get out of the closet about our own drug use and we explain and we show and we, we present a living example that's inconsistent with those stereotypes. And when you start to see all of these vast numbers of people who uh, don't fall into the categories that have been described, then we start to update our typical view of a drug user, just like we did with marijuana. Today, it's a lot more difficult to pigeonhole a marijuana user as some irresponsible adolescent on the couch eating nachos and playing video games because there are just too many Americans who use marijuana and don't fit that stereotypical view. Well, I think that brings us to big idea number five. Drugs are the number one reason for arrest in the United States. Yep, you heard me right. Drugs are the number one reason people are arrested in the United States. Drug arrests outpace arrests for both violent crime and property crime. In fact, violent crime and property crime arrests have been declining. Meanwhile, the number of drug arrests has remained consistently high for at least 25 years. That is, more than 1.5 million Americans are arrested each year for drugs. And most, nearly 90% of them, are busted for possessing small quantities, not for selling or manufacturing drugs. As media reports would have you believe, what this means in plain English is this. Year after year, we arrest more than 1 million people for what they put in their own bodies. And make no mistake about it, the vast majority of drug users use drugs for the pleasurable sensations they produce. So imagine, if you will, that authorities arrested one million people every year for eating sugary desserts or for masturbating. That would be ridiculous, of course. And drug use for grown-ups. I explain why the practice of arresting an extreme number of Americans each year for merely altering their consciousness is wholly un-American. I also explain how we can change this and get down to the vital business of pursuing happiness. I'm hopeful that with the Black Lives Matter movement in the last year, uh, combined with a greater awareness recently of the positive impacts that a lot of people are experiencing with a range of different drugs, that this may be the time to change some of these policies. Because, because when people talk about institutionalized racism, you know, sometimes I'm sure to some Americans that sounds very vague and like, okay, well, show me the institutionalized racism. Well, here it is, right? I mean, this is the most black and white institutionalized racism that I think I'm aware of, right, which is these insane, you, you know, the punishment for crack cocaine, a hundred times the punishment for cocaine. And I think, I think today it's 10 times, right? Because that times. was reduced a bit. But 18 times. So, I mean, there's no other possible explanation for this, is there? I mean, this is, would you say that this is the most dramatic implementations of institutionalized racism. Yeah, certainly uh, one of the most uh, dramatic examples that I'm aware of. And it seems like a large portion of Americans are now aware of this as well. And like you, 
I'm hopeful as well. Uh, I'm a bit impatient, but I am still hopeful. And um, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. Many people listening to this are going to say, you know what, there's some drugs like marijuana and perhaps some others that should be legalized, but there are just some drugs like, say, a heroin or maybe a crystal meth or whatever people in their minds think are the most insidious drugs, PCP, that are just too addictive, too dangerous. They need to stay illegal. What would you say to those people? Do you think, I mean, would you like to see incremental progress in legalization? Or do you think we really need to look at this as a sort of all or nothing proposition? Uh, thank you for that question. That's a great way to put it. Um, I don't like incrementalism when it comes to people's freedom. And that's what this is really about. I have no right to put a timetable on somebody else's freedom. And for people to think that they, they do, that's quite arrogant and uh, disrespectful. Uh, so I think these things should be legally regulated now. Um, well, what about a drug like PCP? Well, PCP is um, essentially ketamine. Ketamine is used to treat depression uh -huh. now, but the narratives built around um, ketamine and PCP, they wildly differ because law enforcement has yep. been spreading misinformation about PCP creating superhuman strength. That's just a myth. That's the, No drug does that. That's just um, not consistent with the, the facts. Um, and so we can think about heroin in the same way, but heroin is so dangerous. The danger of heroin is enhanced because of it, its uh, restriction, because of its current legal status, which bans it and and so these adulterants and uh, are allowed to be placed in street heroin and that makes it a lot more dangerous uh, people's ignorance about how to do this makes it a lot more dangerous and so I think legal regulation will deal with many of the problems that I'm worried about they will also deal with the problems that decriminalization does not deal with decriminalization does not deal with the adulterants um, uh, and legal Legally regulating these substances will assure a level of quality control. So I think maybe the argument can be made to the, I mean, there are going to be some listeners who are still going to say, yeah, there may be some university professors and, you know, well-adjusted people who can handle some of these stronger drugs, but making them more available to the whole population might have negative consequences. Even for people who believe that, Right, I would say you have to weigh those negative consequences, if there are some, against the negative consequences of keeping drugs illegal. We don't need to make it that complicated. It's really simple. The Declaration of Independence, our founding document, sets out the ideals of what we are as Americans and what we are guaranteed. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So long as you don't disrupt other people from also enjoying these rights. Uh, that means that you can live your life as you see fit. And the government's role, as delineated in the uh, Declaration, is to ensure these rights, to secure these rights. And when governments fail to do that, governments should be disbanded. It's really simple. Uh, I have no right to tell somebody what they can handle and they can't handle if they are a responsible adult. That's not my business. Uh, and Americans uh, like to do things like say, I can handle this, but you can't. This is good for me, but not you. Who the hell are you to make that decision for anyone? Do you think that if we're able to change these drug laws and grant the kind of liberties that you're describing. And uh, obviously there's more that needs to be done to support communities that need more support. But do you think that just changing these laws could meaningfully impact race relations in America? Yeah, I think they will go a long way. 
um, because as you noted earlier, drug laws are the number one reasons that we arrest people. And a large percentage of these people are black and brown people. And it would go a long way in rethinking our view of these folks as uh, just criminals. And it will go a long way in us uh, living more consistent uh, with our purported principles, leaving people alone to live their life in the way that they see fit. Uh, then we will look less hypocritical uh, when we hold ourselves up to be this nation that is uh, the free of all nations. Uh, uh, we know that's not true based on how we are currently dealing with our drugs policy. Uh, and so we have the benefit, uh, if we change these laws, we have this potential benefit of correcting uh, this sort of stereotypical view of uh, that we have of some groups on the one hand at home. And then abroad, we, ha we have the opportunity to live up to the ideals that we purport uh, to live by. Well, thank you, Dr. Carl Hart, for being with us today. I, I, for one, have been really, really impacted by your book and by this conversation. And I hope, I hope a lot more people are. And I, I hope people will go out and buy this book and discuss these matters with their friends and that we can collectively move towards uh, greater liberty and a, a better a better world for our children. So thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you also for saying that you uh, were impacted such that you came out of the closet. That's all we want. Uh, so mad props to you and thank you. If you have thoughts about drug use for grownups or any of the other books in our series, we'd love you to join the conversation with me, Dr. Carl Hart, and the other authors who appear on this show visit nextbigideaclub.com slash podcast. Join now and get three months of membership absolutely free. What a deal. That's nextbigideaclub.com slash podcast. Special thanks to Dr. Carl Hart. His new book, Drug Use for Grownups, is out now. I would like to also express my gratitude to all the friends who helped me explore this subject over the years, including but not limited to my brothers and sisters of Harz, Surge, and Sagapalooza, will always have the shag carpet. Making this podcast is definitely more fun and less stressful than chairing a department at Columbia. Thanks to our crack team. Our executive producers are Caleb Bissinger and Michael Kovnat. Our theme music is by Costa Galanopoulos. Sound designed by Emma Erdbrink. I'm Rufus Griscom. See you next week.